Okay, good morning. Uh, this is very exciting for me. I, I moved to Philadelphia in 2008 and quickly learned about Creative Mornings, Design Philly, everything that's happening. And I was like, gosh, it would be awesome to be in with that group of cool people. And uh, when they reached out for this opportunity, I was a little bit like, oh my gosh. So kind of a, you know, a nerdy little um, pause on, on the way to the rest of uh, my, my talk. So thank you for being here. Today, um, we're gonna do a little bit of reframing. I'm gonna talk about the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. I'm gonna talk about the Philadelphia Flower Show and then hopefully maybe uh, show how those two are connected in a way that you might not have known about. So introduction, say a little bit about myself. What is PHS? What is the flower show? It's actually going on right over there. Uh, reframing the experience and giving you a sense of how we curate the show, particularly post COVID. And uh, at the end of it, if you go, if you hear or see anything about it, you'll kind of have a different understanding in a different context, um, and then maybe even be able to recognize some of PHS's work out in the community, and that will help close that gap. So as mentioned, my name is Seth Pearsall. I'm the creative director for the Philadelphia Flower Show, and that means I basically handle with my uh, team three different areas. It's the design and the overall creative direction of the show. It's the curation of the gardens, garden content, artists, exhibitors, et cetera. And then it's the strategic direction and planning for the flower show. What does this thing, to, what does this thing need to be long term? Where does this need to go? How can it stay relevant? Um, all of that stuff, uh, my team and I handle it. So a little bit about PHS, the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. So PHS, we use horticulture to advance health and well-being in the greater Philadelphia region. Essentially, we are a diverse community. We're a nonprofit, but we're a, a diverse community of, of people and other organizations and affiliate. We believe in the power of horticulture to make social and environmental change. Essentially, PHS believes gardening and horticulture belong to everybody. And I'll come back to that point because that'll tie it all together nicely. We do this. Um, by using four impact priorities um, to increase health and well-being. Uh, creating living, healthy living environments, increasing access to fresh food, building meaningful social connections, and expanding economic opportunity. This is a somewhat new reframing. Um, our organization, we do a lot of different things or have done a lot of small and large things. Sometimes it's a little disparate. Recently, we've sort of strategically been you know, reorient, reorienting ourselves internally. So these are the four kind of building blocks that we try to tie everything to one way or another, or, or filter projects or filter work through. And we do this through four, three impact, uh, three program channels. So basically the organization, aside from the shared services, there's sort of three umbrella teams, and that's how the work is categorized in the city. There's our our public gardens and landscapes, we have our healthy neighborhoods group, and then we have shows and events. So public gardens and landscapes um, hit those four impact priorities, particularly in three different areas. They're creating healthy living environments, increasing access to fresh food, and then they're building meaningful social connections. So what is this thing actually? So if you've been to, say, the Navy Yard, or Logan Square, or Rodin, or many other sites, you've probably seen our work. Um, it's important to have uh, beautiful spaces that are free and accessible that anybody can recreate, hang out, do whatever you do in. So that's what this particular group is. It's getting that belief that all these spaces should be open and accessible. Some public gardens you have to pay for and travel to. These are things that are meant to be accessible to everybody so we can give best management practices and great spaces right there for you to see and experience. We design and maintain over 80 acres of public gardens and landscapes throughout Philly. You can see a few of our projects here, Logan Square, um, containers at 20th and Arch, the Navy Yard, Rodin. Logan Square is a really, really prominent space. Uh, it's not a space that we own, obviously, but we garden on that space. In 2022, we planted over 70,000 uh, rainbow-colored bulbs. It was a riotous display of color very prominent location, and uh, it was a nod to our colleagues over in uh, the Netherlands in Kukana. So we worked with them 
to do this particular plant palette. So just another example of you know, landscape open, accessible, and there for everybody or anybody to enjoy. Now the Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative, so we have public gardens and landscapes, and that's focusing on access to these beautiful open garden spaces. The Healthy Neighborhoods is a little more focused on creating like healthy, sustainable communities, so mental health, physical health, um, really dial it into that part of what horticulture can do. So this hits on all four of those impact priorities that we talked about just a bit ago. So this particular kind of neighborhood or um, umbrella program group, we think about it basically four different buckets. We have community gardens, we have the tree programs, which I'll talk about, we have stormwater solutions, and then the transformation of vacant lots, and then our workforce development. There's a few other things with this tidy little sum is a good sense of, of what this is. So the tree programs here in Philadelphia, many of you may be tree tenders, kind of a beloved program. It's been around for a long time. Um, it's interesting because rather than planting the trees ourselves, um, really it's a training program. We're training, we've trained over 6,000 volunteers usually in local or kind of hyper-local, sometimes by block groups. We train them in how to acquire and plant trees. We organize that. There's uh, bilingual training in Spanish. Uh, as of 2021, 2022, we planted nearly 3,000 street trees with these community groups, 112 of them. And we also uh, work with these groups to become checkers so that we can document with a tag and try to maintain and, and make sure these trees are not just dying, you know, two days after we've been planting them. And we've planted over 25,000 since 1991. So a pretty interesting way that PHS uh, aspires to not just do the work, but to teach others how to do the work. Uh, just another example uh, of, of tree canopy coverage. Ideal tree canopy coverage is 30%. Philly average is around 20%. Many neighborhoods are down not even at 3%. So, um, you know, it's a significant health and wellness issue and uh, just an example of how the Healthy Neighborhoods Program is trying to use horticulture to do its part to tackle that. Another one that I want to talk about is transforming vacant land and workforce development because it's very possible you've seen this work uh, and not really known about it. And um, this is pretty substantial. One of my colleagues, the colleague who runs this program, actually did a, a TED talk on it. So it, it's a model that's nationally recognized um, and even internationally in some cases. We've talked to people who are you know, looking at violence reduction, how can we use landscape and other these methods to assist in that. So it's pretty interesting and it's pretty well regarded, um, which feels good. So essentially, PHS uses gardening and greening and landscaping to clean and maintain these lots. Uh, we will take out the trash and refuge, we'll grade it, get any rubble out of there, and they basically become mini parks. Um, and they create kind of that little nod to broken windows where if somebody's caring for it and using the space, it gives the perception, well the perception becomes reality that people do care about the space and they do want to use it. And that absolutely happens. So what is a vacant lot? This is a vacant lot. Philadelphia has many of them. No doubt you've seen them. Philly has this many of them. There is uh, nearly 40,000. So um, it's a pretty big issue for Philadelphia. We do our small part. We tackle about a third, maintain about a third of that. So about 13,000, um, which is pretty substantial and, and gaining more and more all the time. So as I said, these become mini parks getting that access to horticulture, giving examples of this that anybody can use, not just in one place, but in and around the community, not just Center City, but all throughout Philadelphia. Um, a few that I want to call out, 4th and CB more. Um, everybody loves a good before and after pic, so you can see what these start at and what they end at. And uh, the nice thing is that image on the right there, that's pretty much how you can identify that work. So graded, it's usually got a white fence. Sometimes it's not painted white, but they started off painted white so you could easily identify them and see this federation throughout the city. They're graded, usually simple plantings um, and, and trees. And like I said, they become little mini parks, little anchors. 
Another one, the Peace Garden on 29th Street. A lovely planting, you know, not too dissimilar from a plant palette that you might find at the Navy Yard or in Center City, right here in a neighborhood. Now, we just got done talking about the three kind of, well, the two first two buckets of what PHS does. We talked about public gardens and landscapes, what that is. We talked about the Healthy Initiative uh, group, the, the umbrella of those programs and what that is. And, and then, as I said, the goal today is to relate how the Flower Show fits into that. And that's what we're going to transition to now. We see the Flower Show as at least um, impacting four of those points, creating healthy living environments, expanding economic opportunity, building social, uh, meaningful social connections. So what is the Flower Show essentially, right? This is an annual event. It's really meant to celebrate gardens and horticulture, first started in 1829, really kind of as people just with their individual plants, non-professionals, you know, all gathering and sharing enthusiasm over individual plants. Current participants are local, national, and international, um, which in a couple of slides might surprise you who has been a part of the flower show. One interesting differentiator between this particular project and other peer projects or, or peer shows around the world is the tying to the mission. So it's professional and then it's non-professional content. So we have world-class people, world-class designers, you know, really big in the fields that they're in, and that is definitely a part of the show. But in keeping with the rest of the mission, a good third of the show is the non-professional content. Anybody can be a part. We could enter this aglanema in right now and maybe win something. Um, and that's pretty important. So, you know, when you come to the show, you'll see big kind of splashy displays, and eventually you make your way to smaller displays, which are frequently maybe a community group or a uh, non-professional trying their hand at a concept. And then down to the individual plant material, where there's just a plant lover who loves that little pothos they've been nurturing and uh, they want to meet other plant enthusiasts. So that's something that's different that you won't find at a lot of these other types of events and experiences. Um, anybody can enter. And then lastly and most directly, it's a fundraiser. So it's, it's going and, and directly funding um, the, the work that we just saw. It's not going to fund something happening in 10 years or 13 years if we can you know, kind of slalom through the paperwork, right? There's real time things happening. You can see evidence of it right there in the city and it's unrestricted funding that goes directly to help these programs or the shared services that support these programs. So uh, I like to think about kind of the pre-COVID and then the post-COVID world. I guess there's actually three. There's pre-COVID, there's COVID, and then there's post-COVID. So a lot of the things I'm gonna show you on the next slides had sort of started during or, or right before COVID, but it's a huge event with a ton of stakeholders. There's over 3,000 volunteers who passionately and rightfully so feel like they own a part of the flower show. Um, it's been around forever. Some people have been doing this for 40 or 50 years. So that kind of affiliation and that kind of you know, ownership is great, but it needs to be handled with care as you sort of redirect this, this ship around. Um, but COVID was a unique opportunity in that we were able to use that event to uh, maneuver a lot of changes that would have otherwise taken a long time. And so that's why I say this sort of pre-COVID and post-COVID. Uh, we were outside for two years in FDR Park. If anybody went, it was a totally different experience than this, which is great too. I'll talk about that. But um, FDR is you know, a park designed by the Olmsted firm. So we don't have a lot of that style of park in Philadelphia with the great prospect and refuge and meandering paths. And so it was really cool. Um, it was fun to work with them because we were able to sort of, you know, help them move along some projects that they were trying to get done. We were able to help restore the park, um, restore several of the structures, redo many of the pathways. So again, kind of direct action and betterment of a public space, um, you know, through the organization and through the flower show, which was um, pretty cool to see it in practice real time. Now, I have been with PHS for um, almost 10 years, not necessarily in this capacity, doing other design work. I started as a landscape designer and eventually moved into this role. And to this day, this is still probably what most people think of the flower show. You think Princess Grace judging like an arrangement of some sort, 
I still hear about the Civic Center from the 60s, you know, uh, another person, you know, from a, a specific garden club. In this instance, it's a royal from Monaco. Uh, and there still is this, and that's fine, and, and still a part of the show, and there is that. But I, as I said, post-COVID, the show has dr drastically evolved past just standalone displays for the sake of beauty and individual plants on display. We love that. We welcome it. It's still part of the show, but you'll see that the curated content is becoming more elevated, more diverse, or more diverse, more intent on responding to what's happening in the world. It's a big initiative at the organization. It's a big deal for us, and COVID helped us really kind of streamline that a little bit. So we talked about reframing what this event is through kind of how it fits, how these pieces of the puzzle fit. So personally, I think of the flower show as a place for, connect, uh, for connecting and convening ideas for how horticulture can advance health and well-being. So it's a connector and a convener in my mind. Designers, exhibitors, judges who participate, it's a wide variety of diverse individuals who have something to say or something important to share. So it's a platform for folks who have the same priorities that the organization has. And that is this idea of curating for the sense of the greater good. At the organization, at PHS, we have an ethos, a kind of a philosophy, if you will, on what it means to garden for the greater good. So gardening for the greater good is based on four principles, four kind of loose principles. Uh, it means celebrate gardening, so plant what you love. Almost any space can be a garden. Choose your plants with intention. Choose plants that benefit wildlife. Choose organic. See your garden as part of a system. It's not just a standalone thing, but it's this living network. It's a system. So, you know, compost, go electric, there's many other bullet points we could have here, but it's part of a system. And then lastly, embrace a sharing mindset. So donate produce, mentor, share knowledge, get somebody else involved, take somebody to the flower show, right? Those are the four underpinnings. It's gardening for the greater good is what that ethos is. And since COVID, we've been able to start to curate the show, curate the exhibitors and the content more and more uh, in line with something like this. So, you know, previous to COVID, we had, you know, a lot of place-based themes, um, all great, wonderful stuff. You'll see a little bit more of the gardening for the greater good ethos as we bring the show and the theme and the content in line with the rest of the, uh, what the organization is doing out in the world. So the next three slides, um, are some interesting people you might not know have done something with the flower show. Martha Schwartz did a garden with us last year, uh, the OG of crazy thought-provoking landscape. Um, I couldn't believe it that Martha Schwartz uh, was at the show. I come from a landscape design or architecture background, so it probably meant more to me than it did to most people on the staff, and I'm like, guys, freaking Martha Schwartz is here. Um, <laughs> David Rubin, Land Collective, our very own David Rubin in Old City, Amazing firm, amazing group of designers and thinkers. They did an incredible garden this year. His amazing tool collection is on display, or they did a garden last year. His incredible antique tool collection is on display. Uh, a wonderful thinker in landscape and, and open spaces that are accessible for all. Far and wide, Hari Hanto is from Singapore. Abdallah Tibet is from Olin. Olin has participated in this way. Juan Boy Ippolito, amazing garden designer in Long Island. She seems to know everybody that I talk to. Um, Ill Exotics down in South Philly, redefining how young people or a younger generation interact with plant material. Uh, David Hill at Auburn University worked with Abra Lee from Conquer the Soil to do this incredible student project last year. Jeff Lethem is Kim Kardashian's florist. He did a project with us. Kona Gray from EDSA, which is this amazing, landscape, storytelling, place-making firm. They do a lot of theme parks and master plans. Um, they've done something with us. Andy Sturgeon, um, some considered one of the best gardeners or garden designers in the UK has been with us before. Um, this amazing collective this year, Black Girl Florists, each one of these, and there's probably two more slides I could add, are florists from around the country, not just Philadelphia, all coming to build something. Um, super cool group, can't wait to see their display. Elizabeth Cronin from HBO's Full Bloom. Conrad from Streets Department, we've worked with him to curate murals, including Lace in the Moon. 
uh, Cindy Lozito from last year, Kat Klar, whose work is down at the airport right now, uh, very provocative stuff with sculpture and florals. Uh, Box Studio has done stuff with us. Um, gardens, judging, other content, whatever their medium is. So I like these three slides because there still is the impression in, in one's mind that it's that first slide with Princess Grace. And again, we welcome that and, and there is a place for that. But as you can see, there's also a ton of other thinkers, artists, designers, content makers doing things. And uh, ideally, you know, people are in line with our Gardening for the Greater Good principles in some loose way. And as we curate this, and you see more and more of this design as platform coming through. Um, you know, slowly we can start to reach more and more people, change minds, uh, change gardening practices, have discussions like that. So that's really how that exhibited content should work on the show floor. So as I said, you know, it's about reframing what the flower show experience is. It's, it's beautiful, it's amazing, it's saturated with color. Perhaps it could be said it's emotional because there's, you know, stuff everywhere, there's flowers all over the place. But behind the scenes, the thing that's driving the content on the show floor is that connecting and convening landscape designers, architects, gardeners, artists, thinkers, even just plant lovers and plant enthusiasts who are in line with our mission of advancing health and well-being through horticulture. So as I said, it's, it's beautiful, it's uplifting, but it's, it's a message and it's a fundraiser whose content goes to hit all those programs that we talked about. Um, Tiny WPA worked with us on this vacant lot project to do this amazing poppy, uh, cool little um, mobile pergola. And um, I'm not saying the flower show made this particular thing possible, but it definitely translates down and makes this work possible. So if you're purchasing a ticket, you're actually helping to do this work. You're participating in that broader conversation. You're seeing some other makers, uh, you know, content, thoughts, on environment, on landscape, on horticulture in the world through display. And when you do so, you're helping advance the mission of PHS. So as I said, those four, boarding, those, those four building blocks are kind of, you know, what we use to filter everything through. Just to review, creating healthy living environments, increasing access to fresh food, building meaningful social connections, and expanding economic opportunity. Those are those four pieces that we try to align everything we do. The public gardens and landscapes is the one team. The healthy neighborhoods is the, the middle team here. And then the shows and the events is the connecting and the convening of ideas in that sort of dynamic, emotional way that only gathering and events can do as we are here doing today. And lastly, I'll end with this particular slide. So this is uh, the Cocodama Forest. Um, this is Nomad Studio based out of Spain and in New York as well. And this is a cool project, very simple concave uh, structure that you walk into and it's a seedling forest. And it's pretty cool when you're in there, you're looking around, it's got 300 little saplings, uh, all mid-Atlantic natives. So, you know, you have this beautiful display, it's motivated by an interesting statement to the world. And then the end goal, the metalwork went to a campus in Texas as a piece of art and then an arboretum was able to take the saplings and then receive 300 native trees from it. So, you know, I would say a win-win-win because you have a, a great exhibit. You've got something that's really cool to look at if, you know, you want to keep it nice and light. And then it's going on to do awesome work uh, afterwards. So, um, and there's many examples of this, but um, one of my favorites as well. So, thank you very much. And um, I will pass it back over to... Um, Oh, Seth, you're not done yet. Oh, no. No. Oh, God. It's Q&A. Oh, gosh. Okay. Don't try to get out of this. Thank you. Maybe I'm for Seth. Okay. And then we send it back to Jermaine. Okay. And I won't pass it yet. No passing. Does cool. anyone have any questions? Or do you want to let them off the hook? Don't do it. I've got a question. Yeah. Do this game show style. Hi. I'm just curious, um, with all the amazing programming and events that you produce, like how your creative services team works, like how many designers there are, and your approach to all the signage and wayfinding, creating like a cohesive Ooh. brand across the Dang. whole city. <laughs> that is a good one. So we have a, um, a hardworking and beleaguered team who is 
working furiously as a graphic designer does. And um, Kristen Bauer leads that team, um, and it's in our marketing team. And they, you know, split their time between wayfinding and initiatives throughout the organization, um, you know, in the community, and then the flower show. You know, signage for big events in general is is tricky. Do you go digital, um, which is expensive? Do you go uh, print and try to reuse? And if you do that, you know, how long is that brand going to be good for? Are we going to make this work for five years? So um, it's uh, it's graphic designers tucked within our marketing team, and the marketing team basically oversees the master plan of graphic content, and then you end up, you know, imperfectly doing the best you can juggling between, you know, signs getting replaced. Are we going to redo the branding next year? Do we want to pay for the other sign again? So we still have a lot of those like really nitty gritty nuts and bolts details. But um, and then my team um, also has some designers that will pitch in when um, the graphics when the graphic design team needs a little bit of backup as well. So I would say it's pretty multidisciplinary in that regard. So. Hi, thanks for your presentation today. Um, COVID must have presented, you know, some real challenges and opportunities. The, the shift to the outdoor show must have been exciting and harrowing. Was it always a foregone conclusion that, like, we can't wait to get back to the convention center? Or was there a conversation about maybe this should be an outside show? And uh, what lessons did you learn or can be applied to an indoor show about, like, the visitor experience or yeah. anything like that? Amazing. Good question. So, um, you know, funnily enough, in my Evernote account, I have notes from the first time I dragged a few people down to FDR Park in 2013 and was like, oh my gosh, we need to be out here. This would be amazing, right? So we had been talking about it unofficially and offline. And so, you know, COVID hit 2020, events pretty much shut down. I think we might have been the maybe the last major event in the country of our size who uh, still you know, we, we sort of ended and then two days later, everything shut down. And then there was, there was a period of uncertainty and we didn't know what was going to happen. We knew that it was important to keep the show going because um, not just for funding, but also because so many different groups use the show as an anchor for their things as well. So if you stop the show, you know, you're doing what you need to do for the organization, but if you are a convener and other people are relying on the thing that you do, it's pretty disruptive. So we thought, all right, because the show is that, we should keep this thing going. We need to do it in the safest way possible. We planned the first outdoor show in about six months. And it was lovely, but I will say, the lessons learned from that show reflected in the data that we gathered from guest feedback to the second show, in my opinion, made for a much more cohesive, meaningful, uh, coherent experience, right? So I felt the two shows were very, very different um, and improved. And um, I was a huge fan of being outdoors in South Philly at FDR. We took some of the stuff that we learned there that we probably wouldn't have been able to learn here. Um, and you'll see there's a ton of changes going on this year. The wayfinding is totally different. Doing a, more of an IKEA style, everybody moving in the same direction. You know, previously when you look at kind of the, the, the pre-show design work, it was a bit more choose your own adventure style where, you know, if I go left or if I go right or if I go straight, I don't know the consequences of, of that decision. Uh, well, I miss something on the right side. The convention center is massive, so getting back over there is like really tedious if I'm a, a visitor. Uh, so, you know, it's some of the event basics like building in parklet seating right on the show floor, which we had outside, IKEA style experiences, uh, the curation and the arrangement is totally different. Um, you know, a lot of the back end stuff is pretty different. So I would say, you know, there's not one single thing that we were not able to reconsider because of the data and the lessons learned from the previous two outdoor shows. Now, as far as, you know, kind of long term plans, um, something like this usually with the number of stakeholders has a pretty long lead time and you end up having to sort of commit to venues and ideas and plans well in advance. And, um, you know, given the state of the world and, you know, the business models behind the events and outdoor shows, it was, you know, kind of a foregone conclusion that we would go back to something where we had 
a bit of a better real world understanding versus a COVID snapshot. So um, I would say, you know, unofficially, it's still something we're noodling with. To me, they feel like two totally unique events. I mean that in the best possible way. This event feels like the pace is different. It's a lot more about these individual moments of surprise. Um, it's, you know, known for its gateway to spring aspect. The outdoor show feels more like a meander in the park. It's in a park. And, um, you know, the pace is just different. So uh, to me, they feel like two different displays. You know, I feel like, um, you know, I sort of unofficially advocate for room for both in the world. So, yeah. Any other questions at all? Thanks. Um, thank you, Seth, again, for, for speaking today. Thank you. Um, the question I have is, I know that in the past, the theme has been sort of like place-based, like, you know, yeah. based on location. Uh, and in recent years, it sort of moved into this direction that is more sort of like um, thought-provoking, right? So yeah. like in your, for this year, it's Garden Electric, yep. correct? Um, what does that mean for you, Garden Electric? And then also, how do you get to that, how does that process come about? And what is, how do you get to that place of what is that theme going to be um, with your team? Interesting question. So I always go back and forth on the notion of theming. Um, you know, I've advocated for no theme. I've advocated for a different theme. And I, when I say I, I mean the, the collective group conversations that we have. Um, you know, and I will say, you know, when you do a huge retail facing event without a theme, we've found that people don't quite know how to orient themselves to what they're expecting. So previously, you know, we did a lot of place-based themes. The themes were decided um, between sort of my predecessor, people on the marketing team, um, and then a few kind of strategic partners or board members. And at the time, you could, you know, use place-based themes and then partner with uh, regions, locations. So when we did Holland, uh, you know, the Netherlands was a huge partner. So, you know, there is on the back end this really practical aspect to place-based themes. Um, you know, and so that was fine, and I think that worked for what the world was. The thought-provoking themes are a bit more, you know, from the vein of, you know, I think any event that's out in the world, you know, is seeking to change somebody in some small way, right? At its very, very basic element. If you're having a big event, you should seek to make a change in somebody, even if it's just some tiny thing. And in order to do that, I think you have to be responsive to what's happening in the world. So, you know, the world was crazy for those two years. So that's why you see subtle themes where you're looking at the way plant material can um, make a, a home or a habitat for you or for non-human entities. So the design prompts were loosely in those for a lot of the designers. The second year explored the connection between mental health and gardens. Um, it's not the same as a Biennale. The show is pretty well attended. Um, it's, it's retail facing, so it's not like you know, just to, to, to the field. So it, it can't, the themes can't be so um, like high or unrelatable that people don't connect with what they're going to expect for mass market or for retail audiences. So, you know, you gotta hit that sweet spot between not too abstract, you know, it still should have great words, words that people like, words that are not super alienating to, um, you know, maybe, you know, a non, uh, non-professional or non-true -en enthusiast. Um, and so that's a little bit behind the scenes theme. Um, the Garden Electric to me is a response to the last two years uh, where we dealed with themes of horticulture and healing and mental health and wellness. Uh, I would say passive themes in the best possible way, right? Like how gardens can receive you and help you heal. So that was sort of the last two years but they can also be exciting, joyful. They don't always have to be just palliative or a response to something. So uh, there's also the, um, the expectations of going back into the convention center. A ton of people love it in the convention center. They're excited that it's back. Um, because of the juxtaposition, you don't expect what you see there is going to be on the inside of those walls. So from that event experience, you know, I'm going through up the escalator and I'm turning right and there's no indication of what's on the other side. And then all of a sudden I'm in this crazy flower world. Like people love that little moment. And we also wanted a theme that didn't get in the way of designers being able to deliver right on guest expectation, 
right? So the Garden Electric was really about these jolts, these moments, these, you know, when you see something so beautiful, it almost seems alive, it almost feels electric. Um, initially, I was hoping it would be a nod to Walt Whitman, but then I reread that poem and I was like, eh, maybe not so much. Um, <laughs> so, um, but it, it really is a show about, you know, a specific moment of change, right? It's the position that interacting with plants, flowers, and gardens, if you learn to see them as, you know, celebratory things, as things that provide a positive shot of something good, then you will, your life will improve or your life would be better if you had that little bit of, you know, those, that little glass to look at a garden through. And so um, that's really what that theme is about. And it's a little backstory as to like, why that theme in concert with the previous themes. Hi, I just had a quick question. If you were a master gardener or a beekeeper on Broad Street, like how do you contribute or how can you contribute to the flower show? Oh, um, well, it depends. Um, I could most directly just give you my card um, shortly after, but typically you would reach out online to the website um, and um, there's a place where you can send a question and then somebody on the back end would receive it and then filter you know, right to the right person. Um, and then sort of more broadly, um, you know, if you were like a, a, a garden maker or a content maker, you know, that would probably come to some version of my team. We would set up a meeting and, you know, kind of figure out, you know, kind of what the next intent for the, the coming shows would be and, and work to find something that made sense. You know, vendors who are selling things, um, that's a, a different team, but would start with that website and it would filter out, pop up in the right spot, so. Time for one more question Great. and then you can hassle Seth after the talk <laughs> in person. Hi, uh, we're in the Kensington area where people seem to be very afraid of, of trees, the potential damage it could do to their under, underground pipes, which is obviously a myth. How do you see addressing that and kind of reassuring people that the street trees won't do any damage? Say the first part of the question again. Oh, the, the street trees. Uh -huh. uh, people are very afraid of them, of the damage it could do to their sure. underground pipes, et cetera. How do we address that? How do that? we address that? So on the tree tenders team, you know, it's pretty extensively covered through, I, f I think it's um, currently like six s sort of Saturday sessions and, um, you know, it is a lot of myth dispelling, um, but just in full transparency, there are some communities who are, you know, maybe not interested in having tree canopy because it hits the door. A lot of people still think of the sweet gums or the ginkgos, um, which would have, you know, lots of leaf fall or leaf drop. Um, and it's a pretty sensitive issue. I wish I had a more elegant answer, but I don't because it's sort of something we're dealing with real time. So it's you know, it's, it's myth dispelling, it's providing information, it's the right trees, so it's letting people know we no longer plant, you know, the ginkgo with the seedlings or the uh, sweet gums with the seedlings. Um, and then it's, of course, not forcing it on anybody. Um, so most of the time after interacting with the tree tenders team, we have a lot of success with people, you know, understanding, you know, placement is considered um, the mess is a lot less than you might think. And um, most people after kind of, you know, concerns can be heard and you review that, there is frequently a change of heart. But again, if, if somebody doesn't want a street tree, you know, we certainly don't force it upon anybody. I know it's not maybe the most tight answer, but you know, it's, it's a real time thing that we're figuring out kind of the best way to work with communities on it. Thank you, Seth. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.